بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبد ورسوله Brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today inshallah we will continue and I think it'll just be this lesson about the major signs before the world ends. So we've already spoken about the journey of the soul as a, of an individual and we stopped at the life of the Barzakh and then we went back and now I'm taking you through the story of the world collectively at large. We stopped at the point where there is a change in the world that will happen and that the balance of the world will be an imbalance. The balance of morals will be imbalanced. Even the balance of the environment and the climate will change. And this is happening now. Some of the scholars, some of the scholars swear by Allah that all the minor signs have happened every single one of them, and that the only thing left now is the coming of the Mahdi and the major signs to follow. Some other scholars don't go that far, but they do say if they haven't already finished, then a few of them are still left. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best about this. They could have all finished. But what comes to my mind is the Furat River. There is a river called the Euphrates River in Jordan. Rasul Sallallahu tells us, you'll find this hadith in Sahih Muslim by the way, that the Euphrates River will be channeled into a different direction. Someone will place a dam and it will be channeled into a different direction. So where there was water will come dry. There won't be water flowing through there. And as a result, a mountain of gold will be revealed. Rasul Sallallahu mentioned gold literally, Zahab, Jabal min Zahab. So lots of gold will be revealed. And nas taqtatilu alayh. The people of the world will fight each other over this. They'll go into battles over this, this gold. He said, don't come near the gold to his ummah, to us. Don't go near it. From every 100, one will live in this battle. And each person will say, because everyone will see this catastrophe, every person will say, I'm going to be the one to live. I'm going to be the one to live and take my portion. Whether this sign has is, is, going, is going to happen before the major signs start or whether they are going to happen within the time of the major signs is the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because there are, there are minor signs that happen before the major signs and there are minor signs that happen during the major signs while they're happening and there are minor signs that continue after or, you know, before the end of the world. An example of a minor sign, or if you want to count it as one of the major, but it wasn't one of the major, which the Prophet ﷺ counted in the ten, is the destruction of the Kaaba itself, the lifting of the Qur'an off the earth. People will not remember except the word, La ilaha illallah. They learnt it from father, from grandfather. And we'll go into that, insha'Allah, shortly. So that's going to happen with the Euphrates River, the sign of the ending of the world. But before that happens, before the major signs occur, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to lift this ummah from its absolute misery and feeble state that it is now. It's going to lift it back up to its victorious, honorable state. Back to its uh, nobleness that it once carried, this ummah. From once being united to our disunity today, it will return back to the unity. It's going to return back to its glory. It will become the leading nation of the world in every sense of the word as it once was before. And even better. This is based on one of the hadith, several hadiths. One of the hadiths is the following, which is also in Muslim and Bukhari. Al Rasul Sallallahu said, Bada al Islam gharibaan وَسَيَعُودُ غَرِيبًا كَمَا بَدَأ فَطُوبَ لِلْغُرَبَاءِ Islam, when we say here Islam, we're talking about the coming of Muhammad wasallam. It began very strange to the people. Strange. They don't know of this, much of this new ways before. وَسَيَعُودُ غَرِيبًا And it will come back in the future, strange again. كَمَا بَدَأ The way it started in the beginning. Just exactly the same way. Then he said, فَطُوبَ لِلْغُرَبَاءِ Good news to those who are strangers in, in all this time. Strange. What's strange? Strange is different to weird. Strange doesn't mean that it's wrong. It just means that it's unknown to the people's uh, customs and traditions and knowledge that they've always had. It's strange. But interesting. I wonder if I was wrong all this time. And this strange religion is the right one. It's just strange, meaning unknown. For Islam began like that. We know the story in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. All you have to do is to read it, and you'll know what I mean. And today, our ta- now in the millennium, we have the same situation. Al-Islam is gharib, the same way it began. There's one extra thing that's worse about our time. That it's not only strange to the non-believers... It's become strange to different Muslims. It's become strange to different Muslims. And the Muslims have divided. And they are strangers to one another. Um, the other day, uh, this brother came from Palestine and is now living here. I think it was Ramadan time. I don't remember what action we did in Taraweeh prayer. And this brother never knew, never heard of this action before in his life, never been taught it. I don't remember what it was, but the, the moral of the story is that he said, I've never known this from ever since I was born. He's probably about 24 years old. So he said, I never knew this before. First time I ever hear it. And it was something simple, actually, which I can't remember, as I said. So it was very strange to him. And we hear this frequently, actually. In my life, I've heard it frequently, many, many times when I was born here and when I went to Lebanon in 1990 till 1994, came back over here, and still we hear Muslims. And to me, I'm thinking, how could you not know this? You know, it's, it's known to the Muslims, but to them it's very strange. I'll give you just a very simple story, a quick one, inshallah, just to get it closer to your minds. In Lebanon, when I first went, I was about 14 years old, up in the village areas, they live in the mountains, that's where my parents are from, the village areas had this strange and weird belief that people who used to be uh, practicing good Muslims, they called them walis, awliyas, the saints. And they believe that they are buried in certain places in the different villages. They say that they're noble men. They're, they're, they're men of extraordinary um, characteristics that are different to the normal human being. They have some karamat, that Allah has blessed them with certain miracles that they can do that no one else can do. And this stayed in their mind. And so in our village, my father's village, we had a huge grave. And in that, they called this person in the grave a Nabi Marmar. Marmar Prophet, he's a prophet, right? He's meant to be a prophet, and they called him Marmar, which is a Christian name. They called him Marmar. Allahu A'lam, if there's anything really buried in there, I don't know. But it's a huge grave, probably about maybe four meters long. And people take their children there to be cured. They go there and pray around the grave, thinking that their prayer will be accepted more, or they make supplications at the grave. 
Now the weird other belief was that there were trees around it and you're not allowed to cut any branch off because if you cut the branches off, right, this person in the grave is going to come and choke you at night. I've never heard of this before in my life. I get up there and they've got this weird belief. Where did they get it from? Allahu Alam. Now when we started to teach them that this is absurd and that this is not what the Prophet ﷺ taught us, and we brought them all the logic. For example, I used to say to them, 14 years old, I used to, it's quite logical. I said to them, look, if he's a really a good man, then he'd want us to use these branches because we're cold and we need to bathe and we need to use it to cook and clean. What does he want with all these trees? And he's probably in Jannah now. What does he want with all this garden over here? They go, no, 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 it's sanctioned to him. You can't touch it. So if he's a good man, why would he want to choke you? <laughs> if he was living, he wouldn't do that. And so on and so forth. And you go and pray at his grave, he needs you more than what you need him. He's dead. He needs your dua. Hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. They looked at us as being the weird ones. We were the strangers. I remember once, my grandmother wanted some water to, to bathe in. It was a Jumu'ah. And I wanted some water. And we didn't have any wood. Up there there's no gas. So we had to light up some wood. And what I did was, no one would listen to me. So I gathered up, about maybe six, seven year olds. I said, come up with me to the top. We're going to get some branches, man. There's no branches anyway. So we went up to where the grave was. We cut off some branches. I gave each child the branch to hold. And we came down this hill. Everybody could see us. The whole village could see us coming down with these branches. And I said, scream out, Allah dar, Allah nafi'ah. Allah harms and Allah, Allah is the one that prevents harm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that benefits. The whole village stopped. We couldn't even hear a, a rooster crow anymore. Nothing. Everybody raced up to me. They slapped their children and they cursed me. And Subhanallah. We were the weird ones. What is this new religion you're bringing us, they said. We're bringing a new religion to them now. We've never heard of it all our lives. Our ancestors have always practiced this. And now this is strange. Just to make you laugh a bit, a group of youngsters come up to me, well, youngsters like 18, 19, they said to me, tonight he's going to choke you. I said, Lakam is a good man, why do you want to choke me? Anyway, that night I was prepared and I recited some Qur'an and I knew that what's actually making him think that is the shaitan and the shaitan can come and impersonate figures in your dreams. And you can get something like a nightmare which is similar to choking at night. It's called a, um, something dream of terror or something, I don't know. Muhim, I saw a little snake in that dream. And I grabbed it and chopped its neck off. And I said, is this your power, shaitan? Woke up for fajr afterwards. And the youngsters came past the next morning and said, you copped it, didn't you? <laughs> I said, what are you talking about, man? They go, oh, one day you're going to cop it. Alhamdulillah, now the village has changed. But I'm just illustrating to you that over there, the religion is strange to them. I saw a woman once circumambulating around the Kaaba, her and her daughters. I said, Ikhti, please follow the Qur'an. She said, the Qur'an is even wrong. <laughs> and this day and age, listen, living now in the Western world, you can't get any stranger than this look, the beard. You can't get any stranger now than the veil of the woman. The niqab is now finished, gone. That's like really extreme to them. The beard is now second. And the practices that we do, praying, strange. Holding on to your five daily prayers is strange even to some Muslims. And weird. What's this new religion, they say? And what was already dealt with a long time ago, because values change today, now everybody is re-exploring Islam 14 centuries ago and saying, ah, look at that. Look how bad this religion is. After they've changed the values today. You can't do that. You change the values and you say, look how wrong this religion is. You just made up something and now you want to make the religion look like it's wrong and strange and weird. So the religion has started again strange as it was before. And the Rasul Sallallahu told us, you will have four transitions. From a proper khilafah on the Quran and Sunnah, Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Then it will become a, a distorted one, Muslims fighting each other. Then it will become a... Um, a mulkan jabriyan, which is a dictatoriate kind of uh, leadership of khilafah. And then 
which is now, there's lots of dictatorships in, in a lot of the Muslim countries, a lot of the Muslim world. And if a person just speaks of Islam in some places, he's imprisoned immediately, called a terrorist and called an extremist and so on and so forth. Then he said, ثُمَّ تَعُودُ الْخِلَافَ عَلَى مِنْهَاجِ النُّبُوَةِ Khilafa will return back, leadership of the Muslims, to the way the Prophet ﷺ began it. And that is yet to happen. That is yet to happen. The last Khilafa we had was the Ottoman Empire. So this is another sign that is inevitably coming. But the thing is, the Muslims will return, the nation of, of Islam and its proper teachings, its proper form, as it began, will come back and will fill the world with peace and justice, just as it was filled with injustice and tyranny. And that's the time of Al-Mahdi. Now there's something I'd like to say here, and note very importantly. We hear a lot of Muslims these days saying, the unity of the Muslim will never come until the Mahdi comes. So just sit down, do your stuff, sit at home, don't make da'wah, don't say anything, don't try to work towards unity. This is a very false and wrong way to think for a Muslim. Allah doesn't ask you, why aren't you uniting the nations of the world? Allah says in the Qur'an, وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ لَجَعَلَ النَّاسَ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا If Allah wanted to, do, He could have interfered and made everybody one nation and changed their hearts and nobody had a choice to rebel or accept. Everyone will be one. But Allah has a purpose in our life. And therefore, don't think that you're going to unite the whole nations. You can't do that. Only Allah can do that. But what you can do, what's wrong with uniting families? What's wrong with uniting communities? A community that you have. Rasul didn't begin with the whole world, he began with his family. Allah told him, وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ Begin with your nearest family first. And then he expanded. So what's wrong with that? And they were unified. One little city called Medina, a few thousand Muslims, that was the nation of the Muslim. Of the, of the Muslim. And then he expanded. But look where it started. For a person to say, I can't unite the world, so why bother? Is a very foolish statement, a very foolish way to think about it. Allah is not going to ask you, why didn't you unite the ummah? Allah is going to ask you, what did you, within, what did you do within your capacity? That's what He's going to ask you. What did you do with the knowledge I gave you? What did you do with the strength that I gave you? With your youth that I gave you? The health that I gave you? What did you do within your capacity? I gave you authority over a family. What did you do with that family? I gave you authority over a city. What did you do with that? I gave you authority over you know, people who you talk to. What did you do with that? So each person's got different levels of authority and power and capacities. Allah will ask you within that capacity. And that's it. لا يكلف الله نفسا لا وسع. Allah does not bear a person more than what they can hold. So don't think about uniting the whole nation. Think about uniting what you have the capacity to do. And that's it. So the religion will begin غريب as it started before... And this is today, one of the minor signs before the major signs come. As time passes, my dear brothers and sisters, after these minor signs develop, plots and plans will be carried out by enemies of, of this religion, outside of it and within it. Outside of it and within it. And this is among the greatest minor signs that you can look at because Rasul Sallallahu said, Oh my Lord, don't destroy my ummah with a common plague that destroys them all. Don't do that. And Allah said, you have, you have that dua accepted. I will never destroy your ummah with a plague. He said, Oh Allah, do not let an enemy from outside of them to take control of them. And Allah said, you have that. So why do we have today the enemy from outside controlling the Muslims and putting him down? Because Allah did not give the Prophet ﷺ the third dua, which was, except if they fight each other within, I will not allow, I will not protect them from that. I've given them my guidance; it's up to them to follow it. And then Allah then sent the ayah down saying, "Inna Allah la yughayyir ma bi qawmin hatta yughayyir ma bi anfusim." Allah will not change the state of a people until they change, change their own state first. So when we changed our state the outside enemy took control of us. That's what's happened today. And this is among the greater minor signs as well. Uh, we mentioned the hadith last week. The nations of the world will gather against you. Rasul Sallallahu named 80 nations. The 80 nations are going to come up very soon. I'm going to explain it. But right now, the, 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 this, this word, as the Prophet Sallallahu said, takalub. He said, tatakalub, or tatada'a. Tatada'a. Tatada'a means they invite one another, like... Like tatakalab, like 
beasts calling each other and becoming wild over you. And today they are wild and in many places in the world over the Muslims. You just don't hear much about it in the media anymore. This is our state. And you know that soon something's going to happen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only knows when this is going to happen. A lot of the scholars agree that the first of the major signs will be the Mahdi. Who is Al Mahdi? Al Mahdi, literally in Arabic, Al Mahdi means in English the awaited one and the anointed one. So the chosen awaited one. His name is Muhammad. You'll find this hadith in Sahih Muslim. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says his name is like my name and his father's name is like my father's name. So his name is Muhammad, the son of Abdullah. And he resembles the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam not in his physical form but in his character. He resembles the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his character. Allah said about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ You, O Muhammad, are on an amazing character. This is Allah witnessing to this. So his character is, is perfect. This man, Al-Mahdi, will be, will resemble the character of the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, he will rule and lead the Muslims until he transforms the world. يَمْلَأُهَا عَدْلًا كَمَا مُلِئَ الظُّلْمًا وَجُورًا He will fill it with justice. And peace, as it was filled with injustice and tyranny. So, how many years did it take for the world to be in this terror and tyranny now? Al Mahdi, in only a little while, in a short span of time, by the help of Allah, with His knowledge and with His ability, will change this state of the whole world from injustice to justice, from tyranny to peace, just as it was filled the other way. So, every, the balances will be returned with the coming of the Mahdi alayhi salam. And the Mahdi, some scholars say he's born now, and others they say not yet. We don't know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only knows this. But as I said before, the minor signs make it a possibility that he probably is right now here. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. We don't, we can't, the thing about the signs of the last hour is that we can never pinpoint them or describe them or give it a time or a or a time span exact, or to say, you know, this is when it's going to happen, or whatever. So we can't do that and pinpoint it. We can only speak in general. Al Mahdi, as in Sahih Muslim, you'll find this hadith, he will come out, he will appear in Mecca. He will appear in Mecca. And the scholars will identify him with the descriptions that the Prophet ﷺ placed about him. There are certain features about him. White forehead, sharp eyes, big, big sharp eyes, a thin nose which is slightly hooked on the top. Al-Mahdi, they know his other signs. Some of, other, some of his other signs are the following. So that no one can think Al-Mahdi is someone else. He has particular signs. They are all authentic narrations from the Prophet ﷺ. You'll find them in Sahih Bukhari, in Sahih Muslim, and other Sihah, the authenticated hadiths. There will be a group of Arabs from within the Jazeera Al-Arabiya, from within the Arabian Peninsula, somewhere near Mecca. They will hear about the Mahdi and they will not agree with him. They, they, they'll say he is not the real one. And they will come from an eastern direction of Mecca, they'll come in with an army. To, to, to fight Al-Mahdi. So the first people in Mahdi will fight are Arabs who are under the banner of Islam. But they've erred, gone wrong. As they are approaching, a group of them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the earth swallow them. They all die. And a group of them fight him and Al-Mahdi destroys them all. Prophet said he will fight offsprings of two khalifas 
And we've had many Khalifas in the past. We've had the Ottoman Empire, we've had the Abbasi, the Fatimi, we've had the Umawi Khilafah, we have many different. And when he says the offsprings, meaning of them. Allahu alam which ones exactly? But the first ones are Arabs. Allahu alam, they could be of the Abbasi or the Umawi ones. And, and he said he will wipe them off. So the first of the Arabs. And the companions asked, O Messenger of Allah, what if among those Muslims who fight him are proper Muslims, but they've just erred, and they die within that battle like that? What's going to happen to them? Rasul said, every one of them will be gathered on the Day of Judgment on the intentions they died for. On the intentions they died for. Even if they were the wrong army. Next after that, so that's, the, that's one of the first major signs of Al-Mahdi. The other signs of Al-Mahdi, Rasulullah said, he will turn and fight an army that will also prepare an army against him in Al-Furs, Bilad Al-Furs, in Persia. Persia those days, today is known as Iran. Whether it will still be Iran that time or not, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. But Rasulullah told us in the Sahih Muslim that they will be an army from Al-Furs, will also prepare themselves to fight Al-Mahdi. He said he also wipes them off. Meaning he destroys them. They have no more power. He disarms them. They no longer have any authority or ability. That's the second army. That's the second sign. Now here's the biggest sign. Then he said, he will fight the Romans. Ar-Rum. In those days, Ar-Rum are different, or are, had a different name to what we have today. It's a bit difficult to pinpoint them. But our scholars tell us, point towards the Europeans. Europeans in general. And Ar-Rum, who are the Byzantines then, are today, today the offsprings are mostly the Europeans. And their branches. How would this fight be? Well, the Europeans or the Romans, they will prepare themselves against this army. Because Al-Mahdi will come out with such force and authority and power to fill the world with the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we can already see now how the fight against the Sharia is happening. So imagine someone coming to represent it with power and authority. What are they going to do to him? They're going to fight him. Before that happens, however, in some time, and I'm not sure which time that's going to be. Scholars have differed about it. Rasul told us to salihun al rum. You will unite alongside partnership, partnership, with the Romans, again the Europeans, you're going to be partnership with them. وَتُقَاتِلُونَ عَدُوًّا مِنْ وَرَائِهِمْ You're going to fight an army, مِنْ وَرَائِهِمْ An army of theirs, of theirs, of the Romans. So the Muslims will unite with the Europeans to help them fight against an enemy that's theirs, that's the Europeans' enemy, the, the Romans' enemy. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi told us, عَدُوًّا مِنْ وَرَائِهِمْ An enemy that is theirs, but will help them against them. Has that happened yet? Was it in World War I? Allahu A'lam. Is it yet to happen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. Is it happening now? Some scholars said it's still it's happening now. Some scholars say it's happening now. Helping them. Allahu A'lam. In what way? But the point is, تصالحون الروم. There will be this treaty. And you'll help them. Against an enemy that's, that's theirs. After that happens... And you'll be victorious. He said, in some instance, and he even named the place on this hill that the, a Christian will hold the cross and he will say the cross is victorious. And a Muslim will be angry about that because we would have been partnerships with them. Why are you now separating and dividing? He'll break the cross. They have a fight. The Muslim kills the Christian. The group of Christians gather against the Muslim, kill him, and a, and a war erupts, slowly erupts. I want to stop here for a minute, brothers and sisters, and, and just analyze something with you together. We hear of all these different ideologies that are coming up now. Atheism, Satanism, you know, there used to be capitalism and communism and all of those. Fascism, uh, socialism, all these different isms that are coming up. They're all religions. They're all religions. What I mean by religion is the word deen in Arabic means way of life. They're all ways. Anything you hold on to it as a system in your life, it's most important in priority, is your religion. 
That's your deen. A lot of them of the past showed up and they faded away. They went. Like communism's dying out, fascism's dying out, Nation, well, you know, uh, a bit of nationalism is going away. Capitalism is still here now with us. Atheism is quite new. And there's many others that are coming up. And these are all, to me, wallahi, are just temporary. They're all going to die out. There's no power for them that really holds them. You will see that really the power that is really happening, the ones who really have authority, are actually the two major religions, which are Christianity and Judaism. Because if you look at any of them, any of these movements, behind them the authority, the power, represent these religions. And then you have Islam. These three major religions, brothers and sisters, are still there. And they've always been there. And their authority, the power, on top of them, represent those religions. Those other little things that you see, atheism and so, all those other isms that you see now, they don't really have strong authority on the upper higher rank. I don't have that. So, alhamdulillah, for the Prophet Sallallahu warning us and telling us about these times to come. So the cross will be risen, and it will be a war of religions, mainly, mainly Islam, Christianity, Judaism. That's what our Prophet Sallallahu told us. With a little note over here so no one misunderstands me. It doesn't mean that the Prophet is telling us, go and fight the Christians and Jews now, your neighbor. No, no, no. Islam is a religion of peace, and we don't fight people unless they fight us. But this is a fact. The Prophet is telling us what Allah told him, that this is what's going to happen in the future. This fight then erupts. And a war between the Romans and the Muslims will happen. Romans in those days. Ar-Rum al-Muslimin. Yani between the Salibiyin the Crusaders, the Christians, and the Muslims. Rasulullah called them the Salibiyun, the, the, the cross worshippers, and the Muslims will be a fight between them. Some of the Muslims will leave the Muslim rank and will follow them. And if you look at it carefully today, the sifting between the Muslims is happening already. The hypocrites, the half-Muslims, the Muslims who make up their religion as they please, the so-called moderate Muslims of today, and you even find people who are representing Islam in, in a high ranks in this new meaning of moderate Muslim. There's a new word now, a new terminology for moderate Muslim, and there are a lot of Muslims who are going within that wave at the moment. You can see it, especially among the teenagers. Especially among the teenagers. If I want to win the battle, I don't fight you. I'll just take your children and get them to my way. So a lot of the children today, teenagers, have got this misunderstanding of Islam. That Muslim, Islam is like every other religion. You've got to separate spirituality between everything else and everything else in the world. And well, I've heard it with my ears. Many teenagers have said this to me. A lot of teenagers ask me, can I wear the cross for fashion? It's because it's good looks. And they're getting them really involved in this materialism. It's a very materialistic world. You get involved a lot into the materialistic world. Why the materialism? Because it's the best method of keeping your mind distracted away from God. It's the best method. Because the opposite, the opposing enemy of our deen is materialism. Once it's of, of any proper deen was materialism. This is what made the Jews lose their way, it's what made the Christians lose their way, and this is what it's making a lot of Muslims lose their way. Materialism. That's what we're in today really. It's a war of ideology and the obstacle or distraction is materialism. The Muslims will have that fight. Our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us the Muslims will send out an army, a batch. And it's not a big batch. We'll send them out because the sifting has happened and only more of the pure Muslims are left. Who is really going to fight for this deen on that day? Not a person who's materialistic. His heart will be stuck to the world. He's going to run away. He's going to fight and lose all that wealth. No luxuries of the world. So it's particular, special type of Muslims that will be standing up that day. And still among them, there'll be the weak ones. He says, this whole batch will fight. He goes, La tara ta He called it Al-Malhamatul Kubra. The Prophet ﷺ called it Al-Malhamatul Kubra. And a lot of the scholars say, Al-Mahdi will be leading this. Al-Malhamatul Kubra. The gigantic war, the gigantic combat. وَحَتَّى لَا تَرَى الطَّائِرِ الذي يطير على 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 الطائر يقع 
من السماء من شدة الحرب. You will see the flying object or the birds or whatever is flying on the outskirts of this war. It's got nothing to do with the war. It will drop from the sky. It will drop. And some scholars look at it and you can probably analyze it as being atomical warfare. Gases that make birds and objects in the sky fall. الطائر, that is flying on the edges, going to do the wall, will drop from the sky. This is the hadith of Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi This batch of army will 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 will, uh, will disappear. Tafna, fana, fana means disappearance. Some scholars say they will have no essence. You you can't find them. Their bodies will perish. That they'll be they'll disappear. You can't find them. They're gone. Muslims send up another batch. Same thing happens to them. The night departs between them and fatafna shurta. The whole batch fades. It disappears. Third army. He says, finally, the rest of the Muslims of the world gather against them. Some of our scholars say, this indicates to us that only a, a small amount of people will be following Islam with loyalty and truth and zeal and, and everything. A small amount. Because it tells you the rest of the Muslims of the world will gather against them. The women, children, men, everyone. All the Muslims will gather against them. All out jihad. He says, they will fight... So fiercely, and it will be such a bloody war that it will end. And the Muslims will be victorious. But, he gives an example. If a family had a hundred members in it, for example, there will only be one of them alive. The rest are all dead. He says, فَبِأَيِّ غَنِيمَةٍ يُفْرَحْ What? غَنِيمَةٍ is like when, you, when, you, when, when you're in war, you take the belongings of the of the people you've conquered. So it's called a ghanima, the booty of the war. He goes, on that day, Muslims will not rejoice over any booty. Because what mirath is there going to be? He said, what inheritance can be given out? The families are all dead. The majority of people are dead. That's how fierce it is. He was saying, like, if a family had a hundred, one of them will remain living. So, why will he be happy? And what kind of inheritance is he going to look forward to giving? Or So the whole world has gone out of our hearts. That's what it means. There's no more clinging to the dunya at all. The only thing you look for is to the hereafter. You want to meet your family in the hereafter. That's all it really is. And it's unfortunate that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to take out forcefully this world from our hearts. The love of this world, yani, the materialism. As it has crept into our hearts today, a lot of the people. Materialism in the sense that it is the priority. And deen is secondary. Third, fourth, maybe last. That's what's happened. So Allah has to force it out in this tragedy. In order for us to return back to our unity and to our strength. This is, on, this is the only way we get our strength. Since, through sincerity for Allah. And this batch of Muslims, this whatever's left, are the sincere ones. They're the sifted ones. In that war between the Romans and the Muslims, Rasul Sallallahu tells us, this is another sign of the Mahdi's presence, an army from the Romans will take a different pathway from the main army that's fighting. And they will go around from the Sham, in the Sham, from the Syrian side. And a group of Muslims from Medina, Arabs, will go to meet them, to combat them, not to let them through. What they're trying to do is to come from behind and trap the Muslims. And this Muslim army comes from out from Medina. The Prophet ﷺ said they are the best believers on that day. The most pious people on that day. They will fight. And the, those batch of Romans will say to them, we are not here to fight you. I mean, we're not coming here to fight you people who are born in a Muslim lifestyle. We have come to fight الَّذِينَ sabu minna. We've come to fight those who left our ranks. Those who left our ranks. What does this mean? Our scholars tell us this means that those who converted to Islam and left the Europeans and those people from, non, from Christianity or whatever religion it may be and gone into Islam. 
and join the Muslim army. These people are going to come, he said, we are coming to get them who left us and betrayed us and left us, they say. And the Muslim Arabs who come out from Medina will say to them, Wallahi, we will not let through between you, but we will not let you through to fight our brothers and sisters. Because in Islam, once you embrace Islam, you become brothers and sisters. So we will not let you through to hurt our brothers and sisters. We will rather die in protection of them. So they fight. A third of that army runs away. Rasul Sallallahu says, Allah will never forgive them. A third will die. He said they are the best shuhada on that day, martyrs. And a third will gain victory. So that's another sign of the presence of the Mahdi. So as not to mistake him. Rasul Sallallahu told us his signs so... Uh, detailed to that point so that you cannot miss who the Mahdi really is. You don't bring up all this other stuff and claim to be Mahdi. Rasulullah says, Yuslihu Allah fi layla, fi yawmin wa layla. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Yuslihu. He makes him proper, ready, righteous uh, in a night and a day. What does that mean? Yuslihu. Some people said, oh, Allah gives him knowledge to become the most knowledgeable person in the world in one night. No, no, it's not necessarily what it means. Yuslihuhu. He makes him ready in a night and a day. Al-Mahdi rules as according to the hadith for ten years in justice and peace for the world. And there will be no more poverty. A zakat system will be applied so solidly that he said... There will be no poor people. People will come with their sadaqah, with their charity and their zakat, and there will be no one to take it. No one's poor to take it. They'll say, no, no, I'm okay. See another person. He's, he used to be poor. You go to see him, there's no poor people. That's the system which Allah created for us. It doesn't work completely now because it's, di it's, it's uh, contaminated. The world's contaminated. You can't bring purity into contamination. You've got to get rid of the purity for the contamination for something to work. So our system is pure. Allah put it in. And when it's contaminated, it won't work properly. It's like an engine that's got oil and water mixed in the same place. It won't function well. As Al-Mahdi's army is fighting, as soon as we gain victory against the Romans, the Salibiyun, Crusades, Someone calls out and says, Go back to your family and your homes quickly, for a Dajjal has appeared. A Dajjal, commonly known as Antichrist in the Bible, Rasul called him a Dajjal. A Dajjal means the liar, the liar, the betrayer, the, the liar, the impersonator, one who lies about his impersonation. Sorry, lies about who he represents. So, he comes and says that he is Prophet Isa alayhi salam when he first comes out. A Dajjal is a man. He's a man. He's a human being. And Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam described him to us to detail. I'm not going to go too much into it, but he described him to us in detail. And among the descriptions he gave us of him, he said, he is awar. He sees with one eye. Doesn't mean he has one eye in the center like a cyclops. He is one-eyed, meaning he sees with one eye. He describes the other eye he can't see with. He says the other eye looks like looks like a grape that has its liquid sucked out of it, moisture. So it's a, it's a mamsuha. It's 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 flat, and it looks crunched up like that. He can't see from it. It's that much detail. And he called him Al-Masih Al-Dajjal. Al-Masih Al-Dajjal. Isa alayhi salam is called Al-Masih. Al-Masih. His one is called Al-Masih. Al-Masih means one with the eyes wiped. Musikha. Al-Dajjal, the liar. And he said, every prophet has told, warned his nation against the Dajjal and the coming of the Dajjal and the prerequisites of the Dajjal. We see the prerequisites of the coming of the Dajjal today in our time. There's too much to talk about it, but there's so many lectures and series about this. The effects of the coming of the Dajjal are present now. Preparation of the Dajjal. 
and everything he represents. He represents falsehood. He represents uh, shirk. So the first thing he does when he comes out, and Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi describes his hair, he says, Aj'ad. It's coarse hair. Very rough, coarse hair. Black. On his forehead will be the shape within his forehead, only a believer can tell, will be the shape of three letters carved in in a certain way in his forehead. The, the letters are kafara, kafar or kufr, which is disbelief. And he is a humongous man, very big man. Big, reasonably, proportionally big as a human. Yeah? Not big as in he's a giant like a dinosaur. He's a big man, meaning he's very filled, full with meat. Big, strong, strong man. So very easy to beat him. And this man, at dajjal he has signs of his coming. Some of these signs are in a long hadith, in Sahih Muslim. It's a long hadith. We don't have time to mention it, to, to go through it, but we'll just mention some of the signs. He said that, for example, what is known as Israel today, in those days in Jerusalem, it will be filled with dates, palm trees. In those days it wasn't at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Now it's filled with palm trees, full of it. Israelis export so much of these beautiful date that we buy and you can see them. A lot of them, palm trees. Another sign is that he said, uh, a man from the Arabs will come out as a prophet and his people will, will expel him from the land. They'll fight him. And he's Muhammad ﷺ. There are a few other signs. And these are the signs of the closeness of the coming of the Dajjal. There are a group of companions who saw a Dajjal in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. He was chained up on an island. So he will come out freed and Allah would give him some powers. And Rasul ﷺ told us that he has the power to order the clouds to rain wherever he wills to order the earth to be fertilized wherever he wishes. He will pass by a hill and he'll order its golds and treasures to come out and he'll follow him like an army. He'll rule the world. The first among those who will follow him are said to be the Jews by our scholars. Why? Well, because of the belief system that Christians and Jews have. They will both follow him in the beginning. The Jews do not believe that Isa السلام, was a true prophet. They believe he was an imposter. They believe in Moses. They believe Moses, Musa was the last of the prophets. And their Torah is telling them about a coming prophet. When Isa alayhi salam came, they said he's an imposter. So they tried to kill him. So now they say he's still an imposter. When Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam came out, he fit the descriptions of their Torah. But they rejected him because he was among the Arabs. They didn't want to accept him. So they've made up their own laws and saying that we are still waiting for the prophet to come. The true Jesus. And a Dajjal will come out and say, I am Jesus Christ. And they like his ways. They will follow him. They will follow him. And the Christians will follow him because they believe, as their Bible says, that Christ will come back. We also believe Christ will come back. Alayhi salam. But our Prophet ﷺ told us, be careful, a Dajjal will come then, Isa alayhi salam. The Christians were also told about this in the Jews. But they get it wrong somehow. <coughs> Because they've distorted their, their, their scriptures. So he will come out and say, I am Christ. Isa alayhi salam. And he'll show them these miracles that he does, right? And that's why they'll believe him. As time passes, he'll start to tell them, I am God. Ana ilahukum. Now it's easy for the Christians to accept him as a God because they already have Isa alayhi salam a God. And the Jews will take it. Well, this is what's going to happen. Some of them will reject him as a God. So he will say, what if I bring back your parents to life? They'll say, yeah, we'll believe you're a God. Because only God can bring back people from the dead. Rasul Sallam told us that the jinns will be working for him. The jinns, the other life form. And they can impersonate people. They can appear or disappear. And he says that he will order the jinns to impersonate their parents. So they will and they'll speak to them. And they'll think that this, he has actually risen the, the dead. So they believe he is God. He's called God. And Rasul Sallallahu said, A Dajjal will enter every single portion of this world except for two places. Mecca and Tiba. 
Mecca, we know where it is. Tiba means Medina. He will not be able to enter Medina or Mecca. Rasul advised us to go there if we can. And if we see him, go in the other direction. We can't fight him. But Al Mahdi and his army will be fighting the army of the Dajjal. Like we'll be, see, inshallah, if we live till then, we'll be fighting groups of their army wherever they attack Muslims. Al Dajjal himself won't go there with a sword and force people to follow him, but rather he will influence you. If you don't follow him, he will leave you alone with poverty. Poverty, absolute poverty. And that's why people will be influenced to follow him. Among the Muslims, there will be many who follow him. And among the women, many. But only the strongest will survive that time. Our Rasul Sallallahu told us that the Dajjal's trial is among the biggest trials ever. Look at our state now, brothers and sisters. The prerequisites of a Dajjal, what he represents of materialism, is already in the hearts of a lot of Muslims. And, and this is now, before even a Dajjal has even, has even arrived yet. And already a lot of the Muslims are changing their ways. Alhamdulillah, not all of them. So imagine when he actually comes up in his actual form. It's going to be tremendous. For Rasul Sallallahu said, if a Dajjal comes out now and I'm with you, I am responsible to protect you from him. But if I die and he comes out, every person is responsible for themselves, man. Yani, it's something uh, that, that, that major. We ask Allah to save us from that. Among the things which the Prophet Sallallahu told us to save ourselves from the Dajjal, first of all, is knowledge of the Dajjal, following the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and second, and thirdly, he said, recite the first ten ayat of Surah Al-Kahf. Surah Al-Kahf. Alhamdulillah, alladhi anzala ala abdihi al-kitaba wa lam yaj'al lahu iwajad. The first ten, to the end. For they will protect you. Allah will give your heart strength if you recite them when He comes. He won't have that power over your mind or over your, 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 your intellect. Surah Al-Kahf plays a huge role in the coming of the Dajjal. If for those who recite Surah Al-Kahf, you'll see that a lot of its lessons that are in there really speak about our time now. Such as, Al-Mal wal banoon zinatul hayat al-dunya Children and wealth are the decoration of this worldly life. And it will approach, it will attack the hearts of a lot of people. It gives lessons of people who are materialistic and those who are not. Focus a lot on materialism in Surah Al-Kahf. Focus a lot on pride of knowledge. People who think they're so knowledgeable but they know nothing. Such as the story between Musa alayhi salam and Al-Khadr. Or such as the story between the man of the big garden and the man who was righteous and, and says to him, thank God for this garden. He says, I got it from my own power. God didn't give it to me. And even if I die, I'm going to go to Jannah anyway because God is merciful. How many people speak in this language today? There are many, if you read Surah Al-Kahf and you think about the Dajjal and what it represents, you'll find that subhanAllah, Surah Al-Kahf plays a huge role in letting you understand the, common, the, the current world today in every way. Read it and try to understand it. You'll, you'll see that it's talking about today's system, how the world runs today. The Dajjal will come and rule for about 40 days. First day is as long as a year, the second is as long as a few months, and the third day is as long as one week, or whatever the hadith say, and the rest of the days are normal. So the sun will be playing its role. Something will happen with the, with the solar system and the galaxies. Finally, Isa alayhi salam will appear. The true Isa alayhi salam. Al-Masih, Isa alayhi salam. Will truly appear. And he will appear in Damascus. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi pinpoints the place that he will appear. He said, عِنْدَ مَسْجِدِ الْمِنَارَةِ الْبَيْضَاءِ The one that has the white minarets. They know it in Damascus today. Al-Mahdi will be praying with his army there, with a group of his army over there in this masjid. A special type of group of army, because there will be different armies around the world. Different recruits, different brigades. As he is praying about to pray Salat al-Zuhr, as he is about to pray al-Mahdi, Isa alayhi salam is brought down with two angels on each side, uh, one angel, two on, uh, one, one on each side, two angels, and he'll be wearing two pieces of garments, white, long shirt and pants. And he will have his hair long and his beard, and they will look as if they're soaking with water. So he has a red complexion on his face, high red complexion, and he has a white face. 
That's what Rasulullah describes him. His hair is neither too curly nor too straight, but he has long black hair that looks oily. And he'll enter this, this masjid and he'll wipe on the faces of the believers there and say to the, their places in Jannah. Al Mahdi is about to pray Imam. Then he moves back for Isa alayhi salam to pray. But Isa alayhi salam says to him, Every nation has its own leader and you are the leader of this one. So Isa alayhi salam prays behind Al Mahdi. After that they head off to Jerusalem to meet the army of the Dajjal with the Dajjal there. As soon as Isa alayhi salam sees him in a temp outside of the temple of, of Solomon, where Masjid al-Aqsa is, he sees him and a Dajjal runs away. As he is running, he begins to melt. That's in the hadith, he begins to melt. But Isa alayhi salam races after him before he melts completely and he kills him with the sword. Why? He says to the people, can a god die? Here he is, I've killed him. Because if he melted and vanished, they'll think, oh, God went away. So he kills him to tell them that this is not God. Whoever's there tries to, Allahu alam, if Allah would accept any repentance at that time. We don't know now if the major signs are appearing one by one or if they're yet, yet to appear. Because when the sun rises from the west, from where it sets, no more repentance is accepted. Some scholars say it would have, been, it would have risen already in the time of the Dajjal or when the Mahdi comes or in that time. Some say afterwards, but Allahu alam. These are the other signs to come, and I'll just mention them very quickly. The rising of the sun from where it sets. The beast that will come out of the earth, and it will talk to the people that they have been astray. The three earth swallowings, one in the west, one in the east, and one in the land of the Arabs. So lands will be under the ground, vanish, they'll vanish. The smoke that will appear above, the whole world can see it. Wait until the day when the sky will come with a clear smoke. People will think it's a terrible torture. And lastly, the fire that will gather the people to their place of gathering. Some say it's in Jerusalem. So the rest of the world will be taken over by a fire, some sort of fire, and the people will be gathered to the day, to the place where they'll be gathered on the day of judgment. Yani. These are the major signs. Next week, insha'Allah, we'll continue to what happens after the destruction of the world and, what, and the lead on to the Day of Judgment. Jazakumullahu khair for listening. Hada wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.